All right. Hello, panelists. So Hello. why don't we start quickly with brief introductions. Can you tell us who you are, what you do, and then a little story about how you personally entered Web3? Um, Josh, why don't we start with you? Hey, everybody. Nice to be here in Bangkok. Thank you for making the trip. Uh, my name is Josh Brandley. I run a number of Web2 domain registries, uh, .inc, .dealer, .llp, and .box. And we chose to launch .box as a blockchain, as the world's first uh, blockchain native TLD that integrates ENS by default. So uh, I started tinkering, tinkering around with Ethereum uh, since the beginning, always kind of looking for a problem that I wanted to solve. And uh, Dotbox is the first one, so I, I jumped in a, a year ago with the founding of, of the Dotbox name. So. Hey everybody, GM, uh, Devin from Google, uh, based down uh, just down the road in Singapore. Uh, really fell down a rabbit hole in crypto uh, back uh, 2015, 2016, back uh, with the early meetup days. Uh, I, I don't know, show of hands, uh, who used to go to the early Ethereum meetups or color coin meetups, but uh, really early days back then. Um, really impressed by ENS, got involved with ENS around 2019, and, and really just uh, really captured by the simplicity of what ENS solves for, right, in terms of identity. Uh, from the Google side, I've uh, been part of an effort around public goods and public data, where we've been doing a lot of uh, open source development, a lot of open source efforts to uh, help, um, help index uh, blockchain data as a public good. And um, I think, yeah, for really today's panel, I'm really just interested in talking about uh, this core primitive of identity, this core primitive of um, really simplifying user experiences, and that's what I think I'm most passionate about. Hey everyone, my name is Steve. Everyone. My name is Steve Petuccia. I'm with uh, Venmo and PayPal on the product team. Uh, we call ourselves at PayPal Crypto BCDC or Blockchain Crypto and Digital Currency. Um, I'm based in Chicago, and most recently I was in charge of leading the integration with ENS and our address book feature across Venmo and PayPal. Um, I got into Web3. Um, I have a history of, of investing in stocks and options and always have had a passion with that. Um, and I discovered Bitcoin sometime around uh, 2016, 2017. Um, discovered Ethereum as well, but didn't really, it didn't really click uh, until I really st understood the power of decentralization and, and blockchains. Um, and it really clicked when I was using DeFi and had the opportunity to settle funds within seconds. Um, those who come from the TradFi world, if you sell a stock, you need to have that settle for a day or two, a business day. Um, if you want to withdraw that to your bank via ACH, you need to wait another one, or th one to three business days. Um, and when I first discovered the powerfulness of just moving as much money as I want whenever I wanted, I, it really clicked, and I was like, wow, this is powerful, powerful technology. This is going to be here to stay, and, and, and that's where I started my journey. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Moises Jaramillo uh, from Dentity, a startup uh, in Santa Monica, California, and we actually integrated with uh, ENS uh, late August to provide identity verification uh, on-chain and also for the ownership of social accounts. I got into the Web3 more like the self-sovereign identity side of the, of the ecosystem. Uh, about five years, six years ago, uh, mainly addressing issues with healthcare. You know, we know, uh, well, at least in the United States, uh, patient data is absolutely private, and we must obtain consent for, for any interactions when it comes to data sharing. And so we thought self-sovereign identity was a perfect uh, solution for these types of digital interactions. Um, yeah, and then from there on moved on to identity, uh, digital identity verifications, and happy to be here with this great group of uh, friends here that I'm making. Yeah, looking forward. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so my first question as a product person is gonna be about product, I apologize. But for you, Stephen, first, like, I'm kind of curious, though, so PayPal and Venmo recently integrating ENS. I'm kind of hoping you can describe for me and for the audience what kind of drove that decision for you all to, to make that integration. And then what additional opportunities for users do you see post this integration? Yeah, there's a, a short answer and a long answer. Um, the short answer is it improves the user experience. Duh. Um, when users want to transfer crypto on PayPal or Venmo, couple months ago, you needed to either scan a QR code, it's pretty basic, 
um, or you need to type in a physical address or copy it from a different app and paste it into your, your app. And with, with ENS and with this address book feature, you're able to transfer crypto more seamlessly. Um, it improves conversions rates, and, and it's great. Uh, the more long answer is PayPal is a publicly traded company. There's no getting around that. Crypto is not the forefront of the business, uh, but it is a growing portfolio and a growing initiative, and we need to consider all potential revenue driving, user engagement driving, user growth driving initiatives. So I'm a longtime user of ENS. I can see the value in it, um, but I needed to articulate a way to our leadership team that it could potentially improve activity and, and actually tangibly improve the, the portfolio of the, the crypto team. So I took a look at our data, um, and our bread and butter of our business is buying and selling crypto, obviously. There, there's fees associated with that. And although the users that transfer crypto and transact on-chain are a minority population, they actually contribute over half of our buy and sell volume on the platform. So these users are much more engaged, they're much more active, and they're transacting on, on Venmo and PayPal much more frequently. So when I went to leadership and I said, hey, here's our current transfers experience, here's how we can improve our transfer ex experience, here's how we can get more transfer users on our platform, and mo more users on chain, telling that whole story and saying how important it was to our actual core bread and butter portfolio aspect um, really was a, was a no-brainer for our leadership team to be like, yeah, you know what, this is actually something we could use, this is something that a lot of the industry is, is using, and, and it was something that was able to get prioritized that way. That's cool. So if I'm understanding, it's almost like you got two benefits. One was you got the user experience upgrade of the name, and then you also got, it sounds like, maybe some growth around specifically insights into crypto users within your platform, and it sounds like crypto users are high impact, which is like great to hear. So, okay, very cool. Yeah, um, exactly. One other thing I think I heard from your team was uh, users having transaction anxiety, so copy-pasting the 42 string versus like, versus like using the name, so I think that, that makes a ton of sense to me. Um, okay, cool. So next question I have is for you, Dan. and, uh, and um, I think most people know that like Google has supported Web3 projects through cloud infrastructure, and I'm curious to hear from you, like what patterns do you see in terms of enterprises? Like what do they need to do to successfully bridge from like Web2 to Web3? Because you all are pro providing a huge part of that service. Yeah, yeah, I love this question. Um, I'd say it really starts with finding a champion in the enterprise, right? And um, maybe just show of hands, uh, how many developers are in the room in terms of building ENS apps in the trenches, RPC? Okay. Um, I think, at least in our conversations with enterprises, it's really about finding the person in that enterprise uh, that really is either Web3 curious or really keen on just what's happening in this narrative. And, and I like your example too, right, where um, I, I, I think if you can find that champion, it's about how do you empower her or him in terms of what Web3 is and what's the promise of Web3 and what's, what's possible in Web3. And I think once you identify that champion, I'd say three, there's, there's three key outcomes you wanna push for. One is simplicity. How can you make her or his job easier, right? In terms of understanding uh, what is Web3, what's possible, and really working with them, workshopping with them in terms of the primitives or the best practices that might be out there. And this could be identifying things like user app, uh, user app workflows or the concept of digital ownership, the concept of digital goods, and working with them in an unbiased uh, measure, of course, in terms of how to think through this space. Um, I'd say number two on top of that is driving for simplicity. Um, does anyone here have a mobile phone with pass keys? And, okay, wow, a lot of hands. Uh, who here has used a passkey to log into like a, a, a Web3 wallet or do, uh, do an NFT mint or a Warpcast? Okay, great. A lot of hands here. That's awesome. Simplicity, right? If you, show, if you work with that champion and show her or him the power of uh, in-device passkey on a TE chip in, your, in the phone with a private key, that's an incredible user unlock, right? And back to enterprises, you know, really showing them these developments that are happening in the Web3 trenches that we're all a part of, but you know, bringing that out of Web3, you know, talking to folks in a Web2 world or the trad world or the app dev world in terms of just how powerful a simple passkey is. Uh, and then I'd say maybe the third bit uh, comes back to data. How can you find the on-chain data to show the success metrics to empower that champion, 
right? And one thing we're doing at Google, uh, we've been doing for almost seven years now, is we've been indexing a lot of chains, indexing raw L1 data, putting it onto something we have called BigQuery, where you could basically look on chain at scale in terms of interactivity. And if you're a product designer or a UX person, I could easily you know, look at user metrics, on-chain events, maybe tied in against the ENS smart contract and find identity, but you can find those business metrics literally on-chain, right? And that empowers them in terms of finding, you know, calibrating the investment they're making in the Web3 and building that flywheel of data and, um, you know, provable engagement, app engagement, proof of loyalty, et cetera, pulling that out of data and really empowering them with, with those data tools to help them make their case as a champion and hook, you know, hopefully help them uh, you know, secure budget and continue in Web3. Long answer, but those are, that's no, how the, I think about that it. That was a great answer. And I think I heard a lot of like Steven's process also as part of your answer where it was figure out like the champion, in this case it was Steven, like figure out the process and then bring the data in to like make the argument. Uh, fun story, when Steven was doing his like diligence of ENS, he was asking us for the data, and I had to be like, we don't really have the data because we don't track every off-chain name, every name that exists. So one of the challenges, I think, for a lot of Web3 companies is you see the impact, you know it's on-chain, but you're not able to like quantify everything in a way that is like traditionally like verified, right, where I could just send you like a report uh, in SQL or something that you could review. Reverse. I have the ENS. Reverse. I have the ENS teams ask me, "Oh, how successful is ENS on PayPal and Venmo?" I'm like, "I, I can't like, really I talk about it. Yet. <laughs> it's, it's still very new, uh, very promising. We're seeing tons of engagement from not just ENS, but the address book feature itself, and, and more users are, tr are transferring on chain for sure." Cool. And then another thing I think I heard, and there's a little BD hack. It's like you don't have to find like the perfect person, like the president or CEO, but if you can find the Web3 champion in there who can like work with you and be a partner, that's probably a more effective path because they're going to help you put in some of the work that's required to help the enterprise transform to like consider these additional solutions. All right, cool. All right, so next question I have uh, for Moises uh, from Dentity. So you've been working on proof of humanity verification and that's now live in the ENS app. Um, how do you see this solving like current challenges in Web3 identity and verification, and where do you see uh, identity going forward? Absolutely. But first, actually, I want to mention, uh, I'm sure you all have seen this meme or read this meme. Of, uh, I think it was published in 1993 in the New Yorker magazine where you, two dogs were in front of a computer. And essentially, they, one dog tells, says to the, to the other dog, it's like, on the Internet, nobody knows a dog, right? Which is cool. I mean, if dogs could actually use a computer, right? Um, I want to say that as, a, as practitioners of decentralization, uh, we all love our privacy, our anonymity. But at the same time, there are interactions where, you know, it's about money, it's about reputation, it's about uh, counterparty trust. At times, we actually need to know who the other party is on the other side of the line. And, and that's why we thought uh, biometrics is an important aspect of proof of personhood to determine that whether I'm dealing with a dog or a, a bot or even much, much more worse, you know, the, the government of North Korea, right, that they all want our, our tokens. So a proof of personhood uh, basically solves issues uh, to determine or, or to pinpoint an individual's education uh, uh, reputation, uh, employment history, uh, you name it, right? These are very, very basic use cases that now we can solve with uh, proof of personhood. And also what else? Uh, I can think of anti-spam, anti -spam, where, uh, you know, think about Discord bots. You know, if I'm interacting with another individual on Discord, I want to know this is actually a real person. So we, we solve those problems uh, with our biometrics. Although, I, it's right now may, maybe an overkill because we do KYC as well, but we realized uh, that there's actually a fundamental problem, and that's the uniqueness of an individual. So with the uniqueness of an individual, what we're trying to solve is those problems where uh, any person, any entity can actually acquire many keys, many wallets, many ENS names, and maybe join a DAO or, or vote or try to attempt to receive uh, airdrops and tokens, right? So it, for us to uh, fight that gaming of the system, we need to actually ensure that an individual is unique across a system. 
So uh, for DEFCON, tomorrow we are releasing now a new biometric approach where we will be able to determine the uniqueness of an individual across devices uh, through the browser experience, through your mobile phone. So I'm pretty excited about that. And then again, it solves those issues of DAO voting, uh, airdrops, incentives, and so forth. That's yeah, very cool. I think one of the things that like I learned a lot like working with you on the integration was I think I came from uh, the perspective of almost like a resistance to bringing identity on chain because I think I have like a very old school mindset about like how you use like Ethereum. But then I think understanding like how users can opt in to verification, how like a lot of this stuff can actually live off chain in a way that a Absolutely. user can select um, and like elevate their their name effectively to have KYC, to have these additional kind of like affordances in the name, like really helped open up like my perspective. I'm kind of curious if like philosophically there's like like your your guys' approach to like integration with ENS because I think like the even though it's a public ledger, I think the culture of Ethereum kind of has like privacy and uh, kind of towards the core. So I'm kind of curious if there are like thoughts specifically from you or, or any of our other panelists about like as the culture of crypto evolves to like start to accept like additional use cases like off-chain identity verification, like payments now, like your you know identity verification is gonna work great with your payments platform, I right? So that. it's like, but to me it's like you used to just send it to a name, right? So like how do you, how do you guys kind of think about that uh, shift? Well, I, I want to mention just the typical case of DeFi, right? Transferring money from one individual, individual to another party. Again, I want to know that I'm sending it to the right person. I mean, if, if you guys recall, um, you know, with perfect deepfakes, uh, I think about a month ago, no, a year ago, something like that, uh, somebody impersonated Elon Musk on YouTube. And basically, they injected a wallet address and he said, if you send me this amount of ether, I will double it, right? So with, with ENS, you know, first of all, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. So with ENS and definitely with identity, when, then we can make sure he was really Elon Musk and like, well, first of all, you would wonder why is he giving money away aside from politics and voting, but, uh, but you will be able to, to be, you know, to be certain who you are sending money to. Yeah, that makes sense. You're going to say? Yeah, um, you also asked earlier what else are you looking forward to, uh, potentially with ENS or other features. This integration with ENS with Venmo and PayPal was a MVP integration. And all we're doing is res resolving names from a .eth to a blockchain address. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we could potentially do more with that. Um, ENS profiles now have the ability to have your socials attached to, to different um, ENS names and, and other information. You can even upload a picture um, to resolve that as well. So when you transfer crypto on chain on Venmo and PayPal, you see, if you're sending on Ethereum, you see an Ethereum logo and you see the first six and last six of an Ethereum address. That's it. And when you look, if you're transacting a lot and potentially sending money to, to several people on chain, it gets a little repetitive. So with reverse resolving, potentially, you could show pictures of, of people on chain with ENS names. You could show the, the, dot e, the dot ETH names and, and other things there as well. So there's ways to kind of improve the confidence and, and UX of, of on-chain transfers within Web2 apps like Venmo and PayPal. Yeah, and I think you're also touching on another cool part of ENS, which is like effectively brands can use subdomains to build their own social graphs. Right, and so it's like you're able to deploy this, have that experience in a way where people are on chain, but it feels native to your application, not native to the chain that you're on. Right, so I think that's like a huge change in how like how you build product uh, in in crypto going forward. All right, so for Josh, so as the first ICANN GTLD to natively integrate with ENS, huge shout out for that. That's like uh, trailblazing. Uh, what learnings? Uh, what learnings can you share about like bridging the traditional domain system with Web3 naming and like all the features that now <laughs> exist in a single product? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so dot box names, they're an asset on optimism uh, that behave exactly like an ENS name. Uh, and they also, the owner of that token is also, has the power to control the matching Web2 domain as well. So by bridging, uh, combining ENS with DNS, we've created 
we've created a, an asset that controls a self-sovereign username and a website and an email address. So we've, so we've brought all those, all those three together. And, and we really think that this is the future uh, of online identity. And I get our, our, our number, you know, we have two really key learnings. One is that, and if there's one thing that I want to impart on everyone here, is that, is that domain names and Web3 usernames are actually pretty complicated things. Most of the world doesn't really want to get into the, to the advanced features of their domain name and set DNS records and set DNS sec, and they don't want to talk about gasless DNS sec and CCP read, right? And, uh, and by combining these two things, we've almost made it a little bit more complex. So we're actually trying to develop a product that, that is better for the user, right? They can go to any app, they can bring their username with them, they can bring their data with them. Uh, apps like PayPal can implement reverse resolution to give their users more security. Uh, they could be proving that that user is a person you know, through identity. So, so our product is trying to make it better for everybody. Um, but where we are in the stage of development is it's actually still very complicated. So just remember, I think my learning is, is that we're trying, to, we're trying to abstract away this complexity as much as possible um, and, 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 and teach people you know, what they can use it for. And then, and then the second thing I would say is that I think we're still really limited by, by great use cases. Right, like we, what we really need are are apps like uh, PayPal, Venmo to be to be issuing these names and accepting self-sovereign <clears throat> usernames from their users. I think it's a great first step, and I'm excited to hear more about the roadmap here. It's a, it's an amazing first step to have a, to have a major app like that, um, you know, going uh, accepting the forward resolution. And what we need is is more established app developers that are acknowledging self-sovereign usernames as the way for, for users to interact. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I think one of the things that uh, I think about your product that I like the most is like your dot box can be your website, it can be your email, it can be your on-chain identifier. It like allows you to take your brand and make it extensible in a way that wasn't really possible before. So I think that's one of the things I find really exciting about what you're working on. and. One of the things kind of coming out of your point that this is for the whole panel to, to think about is like, kind of like, what do you think the biggest friction point you're seeing now with mainstream users starting to enter Web3 and how are you approaching it? Like one way that I kind of think about the problem is, should we be abstracting away the complexity of the chain or is it our responsibility to kind of like teach the user kind of like these new patterns? Like how, how do you think about that as you're uh, working on your products? Uh, sure. Um, love this question. So I'd say in terms of uh, friction points for users, one area, uh, maybe a show of hands, uh, who here has used a faucet recently uh, to, get a, to get a drip on maybe a new chain? Okay, a lot of hands. Uh, one area that we've helped solve for at Google, uh, you can, uh, uh, shameless show here, you can Google this, but uh, we have a Cloud Web 3 portal uh, where we're actually hosting faucet drips, right? So you can go to the Google Cloud Web 3 portal, you can click on faucet, you sign in with your Gmail account, you can get a drip of ETH testnet um, tokens. Uh, we support other L1s and other L2s. And this is something that um, was a bit of a friction point, I think, for a lot of users and especially a lot of protocol teams that came to us saying, hey, we're trying to manage our faucet drips. Uh, we're, we're sort of you know, fighting this battle of industrial airdrop farming and you know, we need some infrastructure right, to help on this endpoint. Uh, so since launching that portal, uh, we've seen a lot of uptake among devs who just want a quick, frictionless way to get a drip, you know, get that testnet drip. Um, and I think that's one area that's really lowered a lot of dev friction, because if you can just lower that drip, the, the dev sheer, he can just get to work, right? Start building dApps, building building contracts, and, and innovating. Um, I'd say a second area that we've, we've really focused on in terms of helping is getting uh, who here runs an indexer? You know, maybe a VM, a Kubernetes cluster, you're scraping an RPC endpoint, sucking off, okay, <laughs> you know, pulling all the archive blocks. Um, that's also a bit of a challenge. And then how do you get that off-chain you know, into a cloud-scale stack, right? Say you want to run an ML model against all historical ETH data or uh, the tip of the chain in Solana. You know, these are very challenging infrastructure um, problems. And another uh, pain point I think we've helped solve for is just getting all that on-chain data, taking it off-chain, putting it into cloud-scale tools like the BigQueries, where we have a public, uh, we have PubSub data streaming, 
um, where you can just, again, empower developers to build very lightweight off-chain tools so they can just get to work and get to innovating. And so if you have a developer here maybe innovating on a new um, ENS v2 or um, trying to scrape uh, ENS uh, transactions from ENS vision, right, you know, that's an off-chain task. And I think that's the key is just give the developers the tool they need so they can just quickly innovate and just lower that friction. Well, you know, when you think about the friction that a, a pure decentralized architecture causes, and, and I'm, I'm talking from the, again, I'm, the old days of self-sovereign identity, and in those days we were issuing verifiable credentials to users for their COVID vaccination. So they had their COVID passport around. But those, those protocols that we used in the old day, again, very decentralized, uh, you know, setting the connections, accepting the connections or rejecting them, uh, you know, going through the workflow of obtaining your, 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 your vaccination record and then accepting that record or rejecting it, all of that caused so much friction that we really spent uh, maybe out of uh, 100 credentials that we were issuing, maybe about 13 credentials were not, never issued because the user just didn't know what to do with those workflows. Uh, we, we learned the lessons. Uh, you know, we, of course, spend the time trying to educate them, but that just does not work. I mean, think about those Apple products, how you can just grab them and, and run with them. So it really is the market who determines the adoption and it drives your design rather than the opposite, right? Where I design something which engineering understands fully, the test understands fully, product managers understand fully, but the market is not ready. So we have to really strive to abstract that complexity from the user experience. And I think, you know, not to brag, but I think the recent density has been uh, very successful in that regard. Uh, our user base is really traditional Web 2.0 users, you know. The 80-year-old the grannies from uh, AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, those are you know, some of our users. And we removed all of that complexity, as, as I was mentioning. And it, we make it so easy for them to actually verify themselves and to share their verifications who, who, with whoever they want. Uh, so yeah, I, I think us, as the implementers of these technologies, we have to strive for a better user experience. Go ahead, Steve. Go okay. Ahead. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I think it's a mix of both. I mean, you can educate users, and in Venmo and PayPal, CryptoHub, we have educational content specifically for that. Uh, other exchanges like Coinbase, they have educational content where you can earn rewards. That's fine, and that's good, but you're only educating the users that want to be educated. And at the end of the day, you want to build the user experience that users don't have to think about what they're doing. When I receive a Venmo request from anyone, I don't need to understand the intricacies of ACH and, and how bank payment flows work. I just get a push notification and I pay my friends. And it's that simple. Um, I, I think it's, there's obviously a need for that educational piece, but at the same time, you need to build the user experience where users don't have to think if they don't want to. They just click and move things without even reading. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's, that's what the, a good user experience really is. Yeah, I was going to give you guys some stats. So. In the traditional domain world, there are about 300 million domain names that have been created. And most of those are, are, are it's like a business-to-business -business product primarily. It, it, it's, it's businesses that stand up a website and use that domain as their, web, as their email address. And what ENS has done is they've unlocked this dream that the domainers have always had that a domain name could be a personal identity, right? Like the domain industry has always looked and said, I want 6 billion users. I don't want 300 million. I want 6 billion. And, and ENS's technology, we believe, has now unlocked that, that opportunity. And, um, and it's so very early still. And, and, so, and so, like, I'm so excited about, about the... And, and the, the key friction points are around, around a wallet, around gas fees right, and, uh, and around getting cr currency in your wallet on the right chain. And so what you guys are doing with Namechain uh, is really, really, really exciting. And, and it's a massive step ahead in, 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 in abstracting. I think the key is about abstraction. I think we could have webinars 
24/7 explaining the technical details of what we have today, and it wouldn't it wouldn't actually help. But um, but getting you know the ability for apps like PayPal to accept self-sovereign identity and issue those identities, and for the user to not even realize necessarily that they're that they're transacting on chain, that that's the key. Uh, that's going to get us from. 14 million ENS names, which is which is an incredible an incredible achievement, uh, but that's what's going to take us from 14 million to 100 million in the next couple of years, and then six billion. <laughs> no, I love that. I think that makes a ton of sense, and um, I think one of the fun parts about name chain, uh, as we've been working on it, has been it's an exercise in abstraction because it's like how many of these features and opportunities can we surface to the user while making that experience feel really seamless? And so trying to work through that pattern of like abstracting things away, but making sure that users have ownership and the ability to like verify, they don't have to trust, is like super important. So I think bringing that ethos into the products as we start to abstract is gonna become more and more important because, you know, Crypto Twitter has, loves to be pedantic about how to do things, but users don't care. And so these these like little infights we have don't matter if we're not serving the users at the end of the day. All right, so then one other question for you all. So like, what are, as, as folks that like sit between Web 2 and Web 3, I'm kind of curious if you have any insight into like, what are users asking for that's uniquely enabled by Web3? And how has this shaped like kind of like your product design? And I can give like a first example. Um, so at ENS, like a lot of our community members really care about ownership and autonomy uh, in, in that ownership. So it's their name, they can do what they want with the name and uh, leverage it how they wish. And so like a part of the name chain design was making sure it was backwards compatible. So if your name is on L1 today and we make this you know extension of the protocol to L2, you don't have to change anything. Your experience will stay the same way because you own your name and you have autonomy over it. So this was like a, a guiding principle for us in the design of name chain. So I'm curious if there's anything you're all hearing kind of sitting between Web 2 and Web 3 um, that's like helping shape your, your product decisions and the conversations you're having. One, one of the things I'm most excited about is um, in the Web 2 world, if you want to run promotions, like pricing promotions, you've got to go and do collaborations or complex partnerships with other companies and you've got to say like, hey, if, if your users do this, then we'll give them discounting. And, uh, we'll, and, and so now, like, we're building this product, and it's my first product in Web3, and we're, we're working on promo pricing, but we don't need to have partnerships with anybody to do that because we can say, you know, we can just say, oh, if you own your .eth, as an example, come over here, prove it to me, I'll look at your wallet, I'll look at your on-chain history, and based on that, I can, I can programmatically define some promotional pricing for you. So that's something our users are asking for, something we're working on, and something that I think is like uniquely empowered by working on chain with ENS. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, love this question. So I think from a product perspective uh, at Google, we've, I, I can probably tell a story. So uh, we, we had a product we launched about a year and a half ago called Blockchain Node Engine. And this is really aimed for devs that need really a utility grade, global scale way to read and write to Ethereum full stop, right? Where you could hit it with high velocity uh, uh, RPC requests in, do a lot of uh, high speed read out, uh, reads out. And it was really um, built and designed for um, big power users, right? So this might be FSIs, these might be MEV explorers or searchers or um, maybe block builders. Um, but more recently, uh, we launched another product on the other end of the extreme, which is a, a free RPC product, right? Where any dev, uh, she or he can just go to our site and use uh, an API endpoint uh, to pull from RPC from ETH L1, and it's available now. And we, we learned a lot in that sense where a lot of devs just wanted something lightweight to get going. They don't need a Kubernetes-powered, uh, globally distributed, uh, you know, big backend, right, with uh, ISOC protection and, uh, and uh, you know, auditing enabled. They just want something lightweight, just to read and write from chain. And maybe zooming out a bit from the, from the weeds there, um, I think a lot of developers, there's, there's two ways to talk to the chain. The easy way to talk to the chain is you just want to talk to the tip of the chain. You know, what happened in the past six blocks or 12 blocks in terms of, you know, did my X copy purchase go through or did, my, did I get that, you know, uh, NFT, whatever it might be. 
Uh, but some devs, they might want to hit an RPC endpoint and do a very expensive RPC call. You might be doing an archive call where you're trying to get a deep transaction to maybe pull up a wallet profile. And that's computationally expensive and very challenging. And so at least one of the learnings we had in our free RPC offering that we launched um, a couple months ago, uh, we, we've abstracted away the type of function call you're using. So if it's a lightweight function call or that more computationally expensive archive call, hey, it's all free, right? We worry about it on the back end in terms of the complexity, and we can scale that. Um, but we're pretty excited about that because we, you know, back to the simplicity, how can you just make the developer's life a bit easier and maybe not... Um, put the burden on them to find the right type of RPC call in terms of the cost to get what they need. You know, ideally, can you make it all a commodity <laughs> in some way? I just want to quickly add, I, I like something that Josh mentioned um, and translated to the identity aspect. You know, we all know that our identity not only consists of, you know, just one dimension, right? You know, I'm a father, I have a hobbies, at work. All of these are different personas. And I think what domains enable in a Web3 world is really the ability to segment those personas. And then to choose what you share publicly and to choose what you actually hold privately. And so I like what you said about you know, how you can create offers on your first party data to really truly customize and, and tailor towards your, your digital identity, well, or your personas within your identity. It's a great, I, I wish I could have used those words. It's a great, creating offers based on your first party data. That's exactly what we're trying to do. And, and we're starting off with some very basic pricing type stuff, but we have an, a lot of imagination for what other types of offers that we can get to in the future. Cool. cool. And then um, last, last thing will be, um, would love for you guys, there's a lot of people in the room that are builders that are hoping that their products, you know, sit on the bridge between web two and web three. Like, what advice do you have for the builders here in the room and the people watching kind of at home? And then how could they maybe, and then feel free to share anything about yourself and what you're working on that you, you'd like people to check out. Just, just go down the line. Josh, if you don't mind starting. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so, well, so my advice, I've given already a fair bit of advice. Focus on the user experience. But no, also I'd say, it, you know, the, the most important thing for success in this market right now is partnership and collaboration. I don't think that the, mo you know, the biggest marketing budget you could ever find isn't really going to help you yet. Uh, we're, not, we're not there at, that, at this stage of scaling in our, in our product. So like, focus, on, focus on where you can find those great partners. And, and mine in particular really started with uh, 3DNS. So Paul Govros here, he's an incredibly talented developer. He helped us figure out our vision and, and ENS lab. So we wouldn't be anywhere without them. Um, but I think that's the most important thing for anybody trying to build in this space right now is to find the right partners. Yeah, and I'd say as a dev, you have, you have two customers, right? Again, you have that champion, right, in the enterprise or in the Web2 space where um, you're, you're ideally finding an area where Web2 Web can solve Web2 real world problems, right? And maybe that's identifying fake data, maybe that's um, you know, social fi or proof of engagement or you know, marketing concepts. Um, but as a developer, really, again, thinking like that champion and really helping them. Um, and then maybe secondly, yeah, user simplicity, right? Um, I think a year ago, things were very complicated in terms of minting and the like, but again, things like pass keys, um, that the space is really, I think, compressed in terms of that complexity, just, so make things simple. Yeah, um, I'm, I don't have a technical background. I'm on the product side, but uh, I listen to people. And my DMs are open, and if you're messaging me something or you're posting about Venmo or PayPal on Twitter or Reddit, I'm going to see it, and I'm going to take that back to our team. And I do have influence on, on some of the roadmap decisions that we make at, at Venmo and PayPal Crypto, uh, and I don't think there's any better opportunity than an event like this at DevCon or other conferences to learn and, and meet people and, and hear their opinion and what they're looking for uh, from a company like Venmo and PayPal. Yeah, I'm going to repeat uh, abstract complexity. Partnerships are definitely huge. But I think the biggest thing that you have to focus on is actually solve a real problem. It really is about the problem, not about what technology you use, because it's just cool. It's just solve a real problem. 
All right, awesome. Solve real problems. I think that's the perfect way to end this. So thank you, everyone. Give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you.